In the ghetto, there was appalling chaos. Thousands of families were milling around, trying to find somewhere to stay. Throughout the early months of 1940, work was begun and closing an area of little more than a square mile as a ghetto for the Jews. On the morning of November the 15th, 1940, the Jews found themselves completely surrounded by high walls. There was no way out anymore. The walls were 10 feet high was a crown of barbed wire and broken glass. Enormous notices were put up, typhus area, through traffic only. There were at first 22 gates, but later the Germans reduced these to 15 and then to 10. The gates and walls were guarded by three police forces. They were the German police. They were the Polish blue police. And they were the Jewish police. The German and Polish police carried firearms. The Jewish police force was confined to the ghetto and only allowed to carry trenches. In this way, the entrances and exits to the ghetto were controlled. If the three authorities could be bought off, a fortune could be made by smuggling food and materials. The Jewish police force, numbering some 2,000 men, behaved with particular inhumanity towards their fellow Jews. These men supervised some of the worst brutalities of the ghetto. Eventually, they were lined up by the Germans, given a brief speech of thanks for their work, and shot in the back by mounted machine guns, commanded by one of the German Death Head battalions. Many of the Germans were afraid to go into the ghetto because of the dangers of typhus and tuberculosis. Day by day, the government of the ghetto was carried out by a body of Jewish elders called the Judenrat. This committee of Jews was the executive organ of the German occupying force in the ghetto. This council was obliged to carry out all orders of the Germans and on one occasion was asked to supply Jewish girls for a German brothel to be set up for the conquerors. Overcrowded, with nowhere to go, the Jews walked the streets, frightened to stay indoors, seeking the safety of the crowd. But the stench was dreadful, and people tried to avoid touching each other, afraid of catching typhus and lice. Sanitary conditions were getting worse. In the early days, enough water had been available for collective washing, and some measure of the lousing had been possible. The Nazis kept a careful and detailed record of life in the ghetto. Meanwhile, German propaganda emphasized the pleasures of the wealthy Jews in the ghetto. Jews were pictured whining and dining. It was scenes such as this that were used to picture life in the ghetto. In July 1941, the German picture magazine Berliner Illustrierte Zeitung printed four pages of pictures concerning the Warsaw Ghetto. It showed that rich Jews in the ghetto were living well engaging in pleasant social activities while they 
allowed Jews to starve in the streets. This boy was pictured as an example of the many juvenile delinquents in the ghetto. In fact, he was one of the thousands living on starvation rations, a quarter of the amount allowed for the Germans and half the amount allowed for the Poles. <laughs> From the beginning of the occupation, no schools were permitted on the pretext of preventing the spread of typhus and contagious diseases. However, sometimes schools were organized in secret. When the ghetto had first been built, a tram bearing the Jewish Star of David ran through the streets. Eventually, this was stopped, and the Jews, without petrol and electricity, used horses to pull the trucks and trams. As well, rickshaws were constructed from bits of wood and bicycle wheels. In the heart of 20th century Europe, the rickshaw came into being, a status symbol of the ghetto. Like all the people in the ghetto, the leaders of the Jewish community had to raise their heads to the Germans, in this case, the photographer. Every Jew over the age of 12 was obliged to wear a white armband bearing the blue star of David, and these were sold along with food and prayer shawls. The prayer shawls served both the living and the dead. It was in this shawl that every Orthodox Jew wished to be buried. Trading continued inside the ghetto. Polish newspapers, Hebrew books, onions, bread, shoes, socks, and derelict furniture were sold in the market. In the market, every last remnant of clothing was sold. Shoes were cobbled with scraps of leather from old shoes. Nearly a third of the Jews in the ghetto were wearing old and torn clothing, providing little warmth against the bitter cold of Eastern Europe. The people were weak and ailing, and some were losing their reason under the persecution. But the Nazis made use of the labor force in the ghetto. Factories of all kinds were set up. In return for their meager rations, these Jews were put to work for the Reich, and for a long time were exempt from deportation. One of the strangest features of the ghetto was the post office. Until September 1941, sums of money and small parcels of food and medical supplies were sent in from a welfare organization in America. These supplies stopped abruptly when the Japanese attacked the Americans at Pearl Harbor. Right. 
reduce rations were a tenth of the amount needed for proper nourishment, and the poor were begging from the poor. No medical supplies were allowed in the ghetto. No medicine or attention were provided for children under the age of three or for adults over 45. Smuggling of food was desperately organized. Poles threw parcels of food over the wall. Small children burrowed their way through to the town outside to collect vegetables and scraps. Many Germans profiteered selling food to the Jews. Sometimes, German heavy machine guns shot down small children as they ran under the noses of the guard. By 1942, the Jews were starving in the streets, and the German cameraman faithfully recorded their agony, even returning later to photograph the same subject. them were ex-soldiers, still wearing the rags of their uniform. The religious Jews were always singled out for a specially brutal treatment at the hands of the Germans. Frequently, they were photographed as their beards were cut off in public. If a man lost part of his hair this, in this way, he would wear a cloth round his head as a symbolic replacement. Jews were sometimes photographed as their beards were burned off. Others were branded on the head was the Star of David. Often, the Germans would cut off only half the beard, pulling off bits of flesh with the blunt knives. In spite of all the persecution, Jewish religious services were held in the ghetto. These pictures were taken in secret and show the celebration of the Day of Atonement inside the ghetto. These people must have been put to death after these photographs had been taken because worship was expressly prohibited by the Germans. Throughout 1941 and 1942, thousands of Jews were rounded up for deportation. Eventually, 5,000 people a day were leaving. Volunteers were told that they would get free rations for the journey. The Germans encouraged them to believe that they were going to be resettled in other parts of the country. In fact, these people were being transported directly to the gas chambers and firing squads at Treblinka, some 60 miles from Warsaw. 